Hey everybody, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of The Game Maker's Notebook, Todd Howard, who's the game director, designer, and producer for Bethesda Game Studios, talks about his latest blockbuster, Starfield. Now, Todd and I go way back, and I have to share that he's one of my favorite people in the industry. And it's not just because the games he's helmed have helped shape our industry. He's just a really genuine, down-to-earth, awesome guy. And it's one of the reasons he's beloved by fans. And I think this comes out in our discussion today, where he talks frankly about what it took to make such a massive space adventure with extremely high expectations from players. Now, we discuss his and the team's inspirations. We go into detail about some of the challenges of producing a large-scale RPG for today's audience, and he offers sage advice for creative leaders, and much more. Please join us. We're all here because we're committed to the biggest question of all. What's out there? Play it on Xbox. Todd. Welcome back. And by the way, I haven't been able to say that to anybody since you are the first returning guest for the Game Maker's Notebook. Thank you. Good to be back. It's been a while. And it's, it's good to a, see you. We run into each you other like, yeah, at conferences and stuff, but um, love uh, loved listening to your chats on this podcast with people and love the ones that we've had uh, both personally and then the chat we had on the podcast a long time ago. So really excited to be here. Well, you've well, and it's a great time because you guys have just had your most successful launch in history, right? With Starfield, and, um, and, right? That's what they tell me. Yes, <laughs> that's amazing. And I got to say, as a player, I, I've been playing it since since it came out, and I've been totally engrossed. Thank you, thank you. It's uh, you know the response has been awesome and uh, really great for everybody here to finally get it out. You never know how those things are going to go after you spend so long on something, but um, it's been a little bit overwhelming, but it's gone really, really well. Well, was there anything surprising to you at the launch? I think the main thing, even though you think you're ready for it, and we've been through some big launches before with Skyrim or Fallout 3 and 4, is just the scale of it. You know, how many people um, are playing, how much it's sort of out there. So, you know, kind of anywhere you go on the internet or in your life, it's just kind of, you know, all consuming. Um, so it's, it's getting used to that, both, you know, all of the positives we get, um, there are negatives that come with that. You know, what are the issues? What do people want? And just like, it's kind of really just the scale of it all. Um, it, it's, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, um, but, but this one is really, um, I thought it was ready, but it's a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, you sc scratch a lot of itches for a lot of players, which is really exciting. We're going to get to that because as a fan, uh, I've, this is a game I've been waiting for for a long time. But in terms of expectations, uh, since you've been the game's primary spokesperson since you announced it back in 2018, what was one thing you really wanted fans to understand before it came out? I mean, there are a number of things. That, that one's always tricky. I think the first thing is... We've been living with it for a while, Starfield, but it's a new IP, right? So it's it's a new game. It has a lot of new ways of experiencing it compared to our previous games. So the main thing was setting up like, hey, this has some DNA of ours. It has some things that we like to do in it, but it's still a brand new thing. Um, and I think because of when we announced it and we were talking about it a little bit early, we're sort of selling like the big idea first or explaining that, like what is the overall feeling of the game? And that's how we start making games where we want to define the experience. What is the experience of this game? But given its scale and given what we've done in the past, people don't know how to interpret that always. Like, okay, I can do anything. So we're not giving them the specific list of here are the things you cannot do. And then as we get closer to launch, um, we did like the Starfield Direct sort of in the summer where that's where, hey, we know everything that's in the game. 
we're able to sort of more clearly explain these are the systems, here's what they look like, here's how they work, um, and so forth. That, but it's, it is hard. It is very, you know this you know, better than anybody, setting expectations when you're doing these things is hard. You want people to be excited, but you also want them to just look at it like any other game and judge it for what it is. Um, and so it's, it's tricky to find that balance, honestly. I, I love that you bring that up and the fact that you, at near launch, you were starting to help fans understand what the game truly is. So you're right. It's a, it's a balancing act that we all have in terms of managing expectations. So was there anything else that you did to help fans understand what was coming without either damping, dampening uh, their expectations and, and keeping their imaginations on fire? I think the direct was... Again, I'm referencing the Starfield Direct, the one we did at E3, non-E3, Xbox showcase thingy. Um, there's a couple of things there. One was, it, it sounds weird, but I think it's important internally, is to show the passion of the team, how long mm -hmm. we spent on this, and getting a lot of people up there talking about the systems um, because their excitement for it. These are the people who made those specific things, and there are hundred, hundreds more that we didn't show. I think that was important for, for us to be like, how passionate we are about the game. Um, when you get into specific systems, what's good is like you can just show a couple screens. You can show three seconds of footage with a menu. And whereas like on a first view, people don't get it, you know they're going to go on Reddit and other places and tear it apart. And they're just awesome at it. Like they, somebody will spend, you know, a hundred hours going through and figuring out what every skill does. Um, we still like... And this is hap we've noticed this with it. This is not a surprise for us. I think it's a surprise maybe for the audience. It's a very complex game. And we were okay, for better or worse, with people discovering things in it and sharing that. Hmm. So they're still finding things. By the time this runs, they're still going to be finding things. And I think that is a little bit of a bonus because it is a single player game where people are able to share these water cooler moments the next day be like, did you know you could do this? How do you can, I didn't know that. Why don't they explain that? Um, there's a lot of that going on and that's, you know, understandable. I have to ask, are there any moments that you've seen where fans have sort of discovered an emergent instance and said, Hey, check it out. There's a lot of things they're doing with zero gravity that we did a little bit. Um, obviously the ship building is a big one. You mm -hmm. know, we, we love the ship building. We had done a lot of cool ship building. We had had some funny things, some interesting things and just how far people have pushed it, how much they like to share that or multi-page building guides. Um, it's sort of like, if you give the people the tools, they will surprise you so much. And that's what we try to do is give them these things that they can play with from outpost building, excuse me, hit my mic there from outpost building to like the ship building mods are a whole nother world, you know, how fast that community gets going. So, yeah. Uh, that's a, I love the fact that it sounds like from the beginning, you were designing systems that would be fairly open-ended for fans. And Always. was there one or two, or were there one, one or two in particular that you felt had the most potential? Uh, and, and has it shown its potential? Shipbuilding really was, was the one because it was new for us. Like this yeah. has a lot of potential to make something that, you know, looks really unique that, that you can take with you as opposed to outpost or base building that we've done that you kind of leave behind. Yeah. It's not like coming with you. We sort of viewed the ship as this other character. Um, and that whole part of the game we could talk about for a very long time, uh, ship combat and everything like that. Um, so that was the one where we wanted to give people a lot of agency and creativity that we hadn't seen other places outside of maybe like Kerbal space program, but it's a totally different thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So one more question about systems for, I know there are designers who are listening and watching who probably spend a lot of time designing systems. If you had to give them one piece of advice for how to design a deep, but accessible system, what would it be? Mm, I have a lot. I mean, there are my main rules of any game development advice define the experience. Like, how do you want it to feel? What's the end result? Don't, don't start with a list of specific features mm. because you're going to get yourself into some, you know, traps that might not take you down the right 
roads. The other thing is every time, you know, keep it as simple as you can because you're going to start adding complexity and you need a good base to build on in terms of this is a simple, elegant system that people can understand. And then as you add other, I'll call them simpler, elegant systems, when they, if the player understands the rules of those, when those start colliding, that's where you're getting some really good gameplay that the player is the one who figured it out. The player is the one who expressed their creativity and they're feeling this moment of, you, you, they did this. You didn't do it as a designer, the player did it. I love it. I, I should be taking notes, but that is the- <laughs> And you see that, look, you see that in other games. Like, True. you know, the recent Zelda, all that whole system is awesome. And I could go through other games that do that, but that's usually where, even if it's all ramble, even if it's like a skill system, you know, some of those can get um, sometimes complicated in games and just how you expose that to somebody for how you want to develop a character. So you sort of take everything from upgrading weapons and building your base to your spaceship or exploring planets and having these sort of simpler things that overlap to create, you know, a flow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I think a really great term for it, right? That flow. And I know that we often use it in relation to other features in games like combat, for example, but I think system flow is something that we probably do need to talk about more frequently in the industry, because you're right. That is, that creates a more seamless and coherent experience, especially with a game as complex as Starfield. Yeah, definitely. Well, to make a clunky transition using systems, we're both now part of a much larger system than we were a few years ago. And so a big change that occurred during production, I know for y'all, is that Bethesda became part of Microsoft. And we right. went through the same transition with Sony when we were making Spider-Man. So a couple questions. Uh, what is this the like? cool part where we get like spicy talk about being acquired by a console? Well, well kind of. Yeah, I wanted to ask, are we sworn, <laughs> are we sworn enemies now? Should we even be are talking? Are allowed to talk? Yeah. <laughs> God. I love your games. It's a shame. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's true. Thank God you guys publish on PC. I love that because I can. Right, I right. don't necessarily have to have all the consoles. I have a PC right in front of me that I can play Starfield on. So I, I, I know for I cut us, you off. Go ahead with your question. Well, the question really is: Did it? Was there? Was it disruptive at all when you were making Starfield to make this transition, or was it something that was sort of happening in the background? You know, for us, honestly, and I, I'm sure you can say the same in your experience, it's, it's really natural, right? You worked with Sony for so long and so many IPs and things like that. And we've worked with Xbox from the very beginning with Morrowind. So for us, it was a very smooth transition, particularly on the development side. These were people we were already working with um, as a major third party we did a lot of ex exclusive type things with them. So it was great. They're obviously, look, corporate things when those, you know, when you're dealing with thousands of employees that, that happen. Yeah. Um, and, but all of it went really smoothly. They've been, they've been great partners with us and uh, we've been really, really happy um, with it and how the game has come out because of it. That, that's great to hear. And I, I have to say, we've worked with Microsoft and I, I have a, we have a lot of friends over there. Uh, I miss Many of the people that we used to work with at Microsoft, really good folks. So yeah, look, when Starfield came out, I got some great notes from my friends at Sony. We had a great, you know, experience with them. We're still supporting games on PlayStation as well. So I know there's like a lot of there's so much like talk about it out there, but it's like you're inside, it's like it's not as much of a thing. I mean, you could probably say the same. It's not, uh, yeah. It's I mean, we are we are all focused on the games, right? The, it, the noise around the games is always entertaining. But when it comes down to it, we're trying to make the best experience we can for the most people we can, right? That's, yeah, that's the, like, that's a question we would get a lot is like, hey, how do you feel about this? Or is this a lot of outside? Like, no, we like, we're the same people heads down trying to make the best game that we can. And the rest of that doesn't, it doesn't come into play for what we're trying to do, you know, on a day to day or week to week basis. Yeah. It is fun to read about though. So sometimes <laughs> depends <laughs> who you are. <laughs> so I want to go back to the game. And I, I found an old interview where you talked about Sundog, which is an Apple II game, uh, which was, you said, one of your favorites. And I got to admit, 
that along with the game called Choplifter, which I played a lot of, it was also one of my favorites from the 1980s. And I've been, I have been waiting for 45 years for somebody to come along and deliver on that Sundog fantasy. So I I really appreciate the fact that you did, at least in my mind. Uh, Most people don't know that game. So every time I bring it up, say what? Um, Let's talk about it. Was it, was, did it come up in development at all? Not particularly. There was like a set of things like, hey, here are games that that we were looking at or thinking at about or a vibe. I would bring that one up from time to time just because I, I don't think it ever got its due. It was like really ahead yeah. of its time, both in like partialist interfaces and what you could do in it. But whether it was Star Control 2 is one that yeah. I like that does a few things. There's Starflight. There's a Star Trek game. There's, you know, a lot of pen and paper RPGs that kind of do that stuff. Or Star Raiders or Elite or just this felt like there's this genre of game that existed earlier in video games that went away because games were getting more complex hmm. um, and that we would like to do something like that. When's the right time? Could we pull it off? So those conversations went on for a while. We actually had a, a project that kind of died on the vine here called 10th Planet a long time ago. That ended up being like kind of an open space shooter sim, uh, didn't follow a particular mission structure. It was more like an open-ended uh, science fiction game. Hmm. Uh, but that never came came out. It never like went that far past pre-production here. We did a few other things. We had the Star Trek license for a while. I pitched a Star Trek game at the time. I mean, there's a mention of all the Star Trek games from Judgment Rides to all of those things that Interplay did. Um, there was a Spectrum Holobyte one, I think, also um, that kind of scratched some of that. But yeah, yeah, I could ramble about this one for a while. That's really cool. I, I love the fact that you're cataloging all of these great space games, right, that all did something unique. And I I, I agree with you. There, there have That's not what you we see in the market very frequently. It, uh, because space games have some pretty serious challenges and we're going to get to some of those uh, that that exist but i want to go back to that that moment where you decided to make starfield do you remember what what I do. You the edge? I do actually well it was kind of boiling for a while and there was a point in 2013 um where we were in the middle of fallout 4 and that's usually the time where we're going to figure out what we're going to do next. Um, just for us to have conversations in the studio. So we're eh, call it two years out, maybe a little more from fallout four coming out. Um, and I was pretty set on, I wanted this to be our next thing. I felt like if we didn't do it, sort of lay it down, like this was going to be our next IP, our next game after fallout four, we kind of would never get, the chance. Hmm. And I went to uh, uh, Robert Altman, who ran the company, um, to sort of, hey, I'm going to pitch you on this game. And I really, I had had the name and I was worried that someone else would use the name Starfield in some way. So I wanted to trademark the name, um, which if you look back, that's when it sort of hits the press, like, oh, Bethesda has trademarked this game, Starfield which was when people first started talking about it because they kind of look at those filings. Um, And that was in 2013. That's why I remember the date. I don't know that I would remember it so well if we hadn't taken that sort of step uh, to um, file for the name. That is very cool. And I, I, I can't remember any stories that came out, but was it noticed and picked up by the press? There were a few, you could go back and Google it. Um, I think one website, my memory is a little fuzzy here, Ted, but I think the story is on April 1st, Okay, which made it seem like, is that a joke? But it's not. And then, um, yeah. So that's when it first became sort of a, a little bit of a talk track in terms of what might be done. And I wanted to do it with enough time that time would go by and it, you know, that sort of thing being out there wasn't on the top of people's minds. So we still do that corporately everybody does they'll file for names and sure yeah, yeah. some of those come true and some of those don't well makes sense and, and and that time you were also in the middle as you said of fallout right and so what's been you know the you guys are known for really defining uh this genre 
the uh, call it the open world RPG genre. So when when you stick to a genre, uh, I'm imagining that you've developed muscles that you continue to apply after decades of success with games like Elder Scrolls and Fallout. Do you can you sort of define how those muscles for you all have sort of become? more specific like do you do you do something special that really you f- feel like sets apart mm. your approach yeah there's probably i have to think deeply about this one about our process but i, I think that it's the things that we prioritize you know mm. prioritizing player freedom in terms of where you could go what you could do it seems like, and people hit this every time they play one of our new games, like picking up all the stuff, they immediately get encumbered. Like, no, you don't need the trays and the pencils. But we like that. that you can pick them up. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, saturation of content is kind of one of our muscles in terms of how often are we giving you new things to do? How many things in the environment are there to touch? How do we direct that? Um how are we showing you the next thing you can do? And it, that's kind of where we, I think, have a muscle where it's not written down. To, to, I think to your point where we people here kind of know it. The other thing really to point out is a lot of us have done this together for a long time where, you know, the main leads on Starfield were the leads on several other games here together. And you have a lot of people in the studio that have shipped a lot of big games we're bigger now, so we have people who haven't. But you know, a lot of the key people uh, have been here for a really, really long time. So we also have to a muscle thing. <clears throat> I've been told, and I believe it. We have a shorthand amongst the people who've been here for a while, just in terms of you know saying yes and no to things, or maybe like this. And uh, and people, we've had to spend a little more time. People say, "What? Why are you all saying that or doing it that way?" And we'll take more time to explain. This is, this is why we're testing it or trying it this way. We're not making a decision. That's the other one. Why aren't we making a decision here? Hmm. That's one thing I see people making games is I usually design for flexibility because you don't know how something is going to actually feel or where you may need to take it given the scale of what we do. So we design initially for flexibility, like realize we don't know what we don't know and so that we can adjust as the project is going as opposed to being too strict. If you're too strict, then it's not working out and you just have to like, you'll wish you designed it to be more flexible. So when you say design for flexibility, are you talking about schedules or final More content? systems, more, th- both. I mean, obviously okay. some scheduling, you can schedule in buckets and say, well, we're probably gonna have to adjust something here. And look, like anybody else, we've had successes and failures with our scheduling. I can't say that we're <laughs> scheduling geniuses. We've gotten a lot better. Um, it's more about the game itself uh, in terms of game systems, um, how weapons are going to work or how ships are going to work or how planets are going to work or anything like that. You know, give yourself room for, hey, you're probably going to change that once you start playing it. You, the player, are probably going to change that once you start playing it or once you, the, the creator, developers. You, the creator. You're going to play it and then be like, uh, okay. we should take it in this direction or this direction or, yeah. And it sounds like that you, you've created a culture around that flexibility. Is that, would that be accurate? That is, I think that's very accurate. And okay. the more people have done it, the more, look, it's, you've been through it. I think anybody who's made a game with a team of any size that's listening to this, that change moment where you, you know, if you're a creative leader, like, yeah, we, we probably need to get rid of that. We probably need to change it. And you just like dread the conversation. Yes. You're like, somebody put so much time into this. Um, and that's always difficult. It's difficult for everybody who put all that work in. But if you get a culture of them wanting that feedback of saying like, hey, what do we need to change here? Let's get feedback early. What matters and what doesn't matter, I think is a key muscle or skill or understanding that you get from the beginning of a project to the end. You know that last six months, what matters and what doesn't matter, what you should be focusing on is usually the difference between, you know, a game that doesn't do what you wanted to do as a creator and a game that really, you know, 
lands with an audience the way you hope. Uh, that is an excellent subject to, to dig into a little deeper, and that is what matters, right? So let's talk about the audience. When it, when it comes to the RPG genre, have players' expectations been changing? Has what matters been changing? Well, I, yeah, I think dramatically, because I think the genre itself has blended into everything. I can't look at a game that doesn't have XP now and leveling up and pick, like, pick any game you want. Like that sort of bled in. So what makes an official RPG? You know, I think if you're an old school RPG fan, you'll have your own list of rules for that. I love the genre because it can be anything, right? It can have action in it. It can have this. You can have other game types break out. You can have a racing game break out in an RPG. Like, I don't know. Um, so it depends what pockets you're looking at. We try to stay true to who, who we are in terms of what we want to see in a game. And we'll, we'll mash things up in the genre. You know, we, we built a space shooter as well. And that, is that an RPG? Mm, yes and no. Um, how do we bring those elements that we think are important to an RPG role-playing game? Like, okay, how does this thing fill a role? How can I make it my own? How can I develop it over time and improve it to make it even more of my own? That's kind of where our thought is on those things and stay away from RPG means this type of interaction. That's, that's that answer? to me, that's a, it's a great answer. And it means to me that you're helping the genre evolve, right? Through the decisions you're making based on what you see players doing as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and given what you're making, which is giant, uh, let's talk a little bit about complexity and, and scope and, and just the size of games in general. I know there's, there's, there've been a lot of conversations in the press recently about how big should games be? Are we, are we going too big? Should we be smaller? Are, whether or not that's right, who's driving it? Are, are we, the developers, actually driving this, this need for more complexity? Is it, or is it players? Is it reviewers? Where do you think this is coming from? Hmm. Well, I think it starts with the developers. I mean, it has to, right? Um, yeah, true. We, we do. And I think it this. starts with technology. You know, the te you know you get, you're seeing new hardware. Um, you're wanting to use it in new ways. You're looking at demos, like, oh, we could do this, we could do this, we could present it in this way. The scale of games, I think, is... Um, I'd, I'd have to go back and look, Ted, to be honest. Like, okay, how big were things before? The one thing I have noticed is because more games are played for a long time, they're live, that the ability to update them over time creates games that people are playing right now that have been around for a long time. They've gotten years and years and years of updates. And that creates an expectation when I'm going into something new, how does this compare with a mature game that I've been playing for a while? Um, Starfields, look, its scale is just, I've used the word irresponsible. It's so big. Um, some of that's intentional. Some of it's just us, we made a lot of stuff. Um, but it is outer space, so we were in the position of always trying to put more in and always trying to fill it, um, given how much space is in space. Um, but even a game like Skyrim, which if you look at it at launch, still a really, really big game, but if you look at it today with the add-ons and then the mods, it's a much bigger game. Um, but still a game that's played 12 years later in, in large numbers for us. So I think if you look at your audience, they get used to a game and they usually want to plus one it. They want to add, they want to add X, Y, and Z. And the developers usually do, we do as well, right? We want to say, okay, we want to add this. So even Starfield, as we're looking at it now, we're looking at it feedback. We have a big list here of here's all the things that we want to add to the game. And everybody wants to do it right away. And what we know, like, okay, let's, let's pick our battles. Let's make sure everything's really solid because this is a game. And it's intentionally made to be played for a long time. It's one of the things we've learned from our previous games, from the Skyrim, from Fallout, that people want to play them for a very long time. So Starfield, I would say, was the most intentional going into it. This is a game people are going to play for a long time. How do we build it such that it is allowing that in a way that feels natural 
And if you, people have played the game and if you finish the main quest, et cetera, et cetera, you can see that. Um, but it's also one where, okay, what does Starfield look like in three months? What does it look like in six months? What's it like a year, two years, three years, four years, five years? You know, I think that's, we've learned that that's going to happen. So let's be ready for it, make the most of it, uh, embrace it. And that's both what we do here and with our modding community. We've learned so much there and just giving ourselves a really, really good base um, of a game to build upon for everybody. That's great advice for all of us who make single player games, right? I mean, I yeah. think the philosophy about if this is just kind of the beginning and we're relying on players to tell us what they're interested in and, and seeing what they're doing is uh, is great to hear. I also really like the point you just made about comparing how, how in some ways we're driven by games that are, as you said, more mature. They've been out for a long time. They've added a lot of content and sometimes making that comparison between a game that's been out for years and years with a brand new game that's just at the beginning of this journey can be sort of apples and oranges. And I know it creates a lot of stress for developers, but it's good that you uh, shared that. I think we all can maybe feel a little bit better sometimes. Yeah, about it's, it's, it's impossible to compare because you yeah. can't like go back in time. And like, let me go find the launch version of the following thing and look at it. You just, it doesn't <laughs> exist. Right, right, right. We just have to kind of rely on maybe early playthroughs that were posted on video right. and that's right. about it. So you mentioned filling up the game as you are proceeding beyond launch. And one thing I've noticed about all your games that I really love is how you fill up the lore throughout your games. Mm. And it is, it's such a big part of the games that you make. And already for me in Starfield, there's a ton of entertaining reading material that really helps me understand what the setting is. Uh, so I just wanted to ask from a producer's perspective and a designer's perspective, What's your process for building that lore from scratch and keeping it consistent across the game? What do you do? Well, that's, you know, hats off to our design team led by Emil Pagliarulo, who I've worked with for, oh, that's got to be 20, over 20 years. Hmm. Um, and it's one of the things that he starts with is, and we talk about what's the feeling of the universe we're building. It was awesome with Starfield because it was brand new for us. That's the other thing with it. We wanted to do something new. We had done a lot of Elder Scrolls and Fallout. And we love those worlds, but when you're starting from scratch, it's an entirely different challenge and exercise um, that you get to do in the studio. So it kind of starts with Emil in building out, here's, here's the universe that we're, we're playing in. And he and I talk about that. Isvan Pele as well, who's the art director on the project, brings a lot to that in terms of look and feel. And then our designers are also our writers. So they start filling out a timeline. How did the universe get to where it is in our version of it? What happened? Um, I did get really excited. I, I kind of like, like astrophysics and those things. And I've been excited for a while about things that could happen to Earth or space time or gravity and those kind of things. Um, so we put some of that in. But really, they spend a lot of time filling out this world so it's believable. Then you end up writing backstories. You put those backstories into books. And so those are initially good fodder so that the quests feel real and we have things to refer to. And then just over time, again, this was a project that took many, many, many years. Um, you're filling that out so that when you step into the game, you feel like it's something, it's almost like a series that existed before. Mm. Yeah. And so... Uh, that that's really great to hear. Is that something that happens immediately or do you start somewhere else when you begin development? We start with a number of things. So the initial stuff starts in the beginning. That's just the high level, you know, what are the themes of the game? What year are we set in? What's the vibe? What's the tech level? What does it look like? So usually we start with like many games, start with concept art, um, we also do music. It's one of the things I like to do early on. So I usually almost always, and it's not like prescribed. I don't have a list of these things, Ted, or like, it's just like, I don't know the nature of it. Start with concept art, start with music, start with like the HUD. Like, what does it look like? Like, what's the game look like when mm -hmm. I'm looking at it, playing it? Like interface, I think tells a story for a game just in how it looks. Um, and I like to say that I can go on a good UI rant, not rant. Please, please do. Segway, I mean, I think UI, UI, is UI being like the party host, 
You know, it's like the menu when you go to a party. Someone's like, oh, let me take you around. Let me show you this. Can I get you a drink? How about this? This is over there. This is over here. This, this is this person. So like good UI is a great party host. Um, we start with UI and then uh, define the experience. You know, what? so for us it was, this is what the game feels like to be the space explorer. Okay. Then what's that tech level? We want to keep it more grounded. We want to keep it a little clunky. We want it to feel lived in and then... Okay, what year do we set that in? We spent a lot of time on so other science fiction universes and what year are they set in and how did they get there and realize they're all over the place? So let's just, okay, let's just figure out what our backstory is. How did humanity get to this point? Um, and then begin filling it out. But that very long answer to that happened, all of it happens organically over the course of the project. The, the the deep lore stuff. It's not like we designers yeah. go away, write it all down, and then we start developing. That, that totally makes sense. Uh, I'm actually going back to a similar question. What does your first year of development look like? Usually we build kind of a first playable prototype. We do that design work, right? We're doing the concept, the music, the basic interface, what it looks like. And we'll, we'll want to tackle some design and technical risks in that first year, make something we can put our hands on and play. So for Starfield, it was the planets, like the notion of outer space. Can we make a planet at all? How, how are we doing this? We know we're gonna go to some procedural generation. What does that look like? How does that feel? Even can we draw it? Can we render something that looks believable at scale? Um, and the ship combat, because so we had no notion of that. So when we did outer space, we started on the ship stuff very, very early. And we're able to use what we had previously had initially for on the ground, right? We have walking around on the ground, we have right. guns and those kind of things. So we were able to use what we had. We weren't really developing that as new for a while. Yeah. And then at the end of that, we have something we can play that has a little bit of a visual look. Again, it's very clunky. Wouldn't want to show it to anybody. It's very, so, but it has, it has enough of like, this is the vibe of this game. And here we have a deeper understanding of the technical risks in terms of these big new systems. So for you as a game director, how do you evaluate objectively what's delivered at the end of that first year and say, yes, this is great. No, this isn't. We need to cut this. We need to focus on this. What do you, what's your approach? Well, we do it as a team, um, obviously, and you want to know how far you have gone, how settled you are, what things you need to go back to, and what's good enough, because you, then you need to jump in and start planning. You're heading toward a larger chunk of the game, like a vertical slice, we call it. Yeah, so look, at the end of a first playable, you want something that is, A, playable. It's, you know, you found some fun in that. Yeah. And the technical part is probably the hardest one to understand. This is how far a prototype is going to get us. What does it look like technically to do what we need to do? And that's one where admittedly on Starfield, we came out of that, like we're going to need to rewrite the basics of our engine in terms mm -hmm. of how the renderer talks to the game loop completely and that sort of inner parts of it. Um, and then I have a rule I use sometimes. I don't know is the best rule, let me say this, but I do like it, which is somebody comes to you, you're looking at a problem or a pitch or a system or whatever, maybe it's an entire game. And then you ask yourself, if that took twice as long and cost twice as much money, would I still do it? And if the answer isn't yes, you probably shouldn't. And that doesn't mean it's going to be twi take twice as long, but it does let you check how important is that to you? How confident and driven are you to pull it off? And so when someone comes, you, the answer in development is always, that'll take two weeks. So I'm always like, if that takes a month, do I still want it? And if the answer is yes, I tell them, go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, and often it's done in two weeks, but you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times it's not. So uh, that's kind of one of the rules that I, I personally use. I love it. That's an excellent rule. So were there any big decisions where it was, hey, this will take a year and you were thinking to yourself, okay, if it took two years, should we actually do it? 
Um, I mean, most of the game ended up in that situation. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think like the engine work was a big one. We did a lot of things in there, the animation system. We just did so, our issue was we did so many of them um, in this game from, uh, I could go on and on. The planet one was probably the most complicated in terms of not knowing how we were going to make it fun for a long time. Did a lot of experiments. Um, how big is big enough? How much yeah. is so much space that you're bored? when you're landing on a planet and dialing that in to, to an area that we felt would feel good. Um, that did take us a long time involved making a lot of different types of content as well. And then all the technical decisions in terms of the system, it's called the PCM, the planet content manager that lays those things out on a planet when you land. So. I love that. That is a, that's a great designer talk someday. Because it's one of those things that I think a lot of us who make games that are 3D have to take into consideration. How is this space going to be interesting? And how do we balance that against the time we have and the detail we can put in, right? And this feeling of that it has to feel like a real space. So I love the fact that you're bringing that up and that you all put so much effort into it. It shows in the game because it does feel yeah. really cool. When you land on a planet, you feel like you're there for a reason and these you're immediately drawn to you know, whatever's sitting out there in front of you or, and then kind of peeking uh, over the horizon in the distance. Yeah. And I would say we still though, like that's a, that's a pocket of the team. And then most people are still on the things you expect from us. Like we're building cities, mm -hmm. we're building quest lines. So it's not that we wanted to replace one with the other. We're trying to do both because we know like we want to land on planets. We want that experience of like stepping out and like, okay, what, what am I going to find? What's going to be here? Um, I do think visually that moment is really important. Like I ha you know, you have it in your head when you think about a game like this, the ship's going to land, I'm going to step out and there's the horizon and there's a gas giant or this, the star. I think those kind of things visually, they, they motivate you as a player in, in ways that are really important. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a great reason for everybody to jump in and, and play who has any interest in this kind of fantasy of, of space travel and what it would be like to land on Sydney alien planet. I think you all deliver that in spades. Uh, and another thing you deliver in spades is space combat. You mentioned this before, and I, and I acknowledge how difficult it is to pull off space combat. We've, we've tried it in some of our games and I think it's, uh, usually taken for granted that, unfettered freedom in space is easy and fun. And yeah, shooting down ships is great, but man, is it hard. So what were some of the challenges you ran into and, and how did you solve them? Oof. How long is this podcast? <laughs> in, in, in three oh, seconds like, or less. I'm and joking. now we're going to enter a seven part series <laughs> on, on space games. There, you know what? This sounds like there, there are enough of them out there that you could look at over time. There were some great ones, Wing Commander, Freelancer, and, uh, is it Free Space? Um, there's a number of them out that, that we really liked. And that was, we went down so many different ways of doing it and mm -hmm. um, different types of physic mo physics models and sliding the ship around. Um, and it, it was way, you're so right, it was way harder than we thought. And we did it through the length of the project, like from mm. the very beginning till, you know, maybe a year ago where like, that's how it works. This feels good. And it's not just the control of the spaceship because you usually don't have things to orient you. So we see a lot of like ship or space games where you're going to have like derelict ships or other things to fly around just to get a sense of motion. So yeah. the smallest thing, like what does the dust in space look like? so that you feel like you're moving, but it's not too much or not too little. So just the basic ship movement, how do you want the controls to work? That takes a long time. Um, then you have the ship combat system. That actually, that part was set pretty early on. I really like, and you'll see it in it. Like, I like the way FTL does some things with power allocation. You can kind of see that in the game. Yeah. I really like MechWarrior, like the, the old ones. Um, that I played a lot where the pace of combat is a little bit more, is a little slower and you're looking at systems and power allocations, but in a way that people could understand 
where we're not having to pause the game in space. So that part worked out pretty well, but you mix all that then with the AI became a thing. You know, it's very easy when you get into outer space, particularly with certain types of physics, um, to make the enemies really, really smart or end up in the situation where you're forever. We were just jousting. Hmm. Um, and it turns out you have to make the AI really stupid. <laughs> you have to have them like they should fly. And well, I'll point out, you know, you have them fly, then they need to turn basically like, Hey player, why don't you just shoot me for a while? Um, and then you give the AI tools that the player can see the tail coming. Oh, he's boosting away. I can do that. So once we ended up with a good pace, like once you're settled on your pace and you're settled on how the enemies are going to move, that's where it came together, where we now we can dive into the systems. Here's really the damage levels and how shields work in particular, how it feels to upgrade your ship. Um, that's a very long answer, but we could, we could, we could do this for a while. I could grab the folks who worked on it. They did, I think they did an incredible job. And that's an area, I will say this, where the people who worked on that, I can't say enough about them, in terms of getting feedback and being willing to completely change it. And that kept it moving forward. And then we'd try things and we'd, we'd go all the way back and then take a different route on it. That's, that's game development right there. That's successful yeah. game development, right? Yeah. And well, their attitudes about it, like they embraced it. Yeah. Like, let's redo it again. Can we, okay, we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that actually, that's a, that's a good lead into another big question about being a leader of these teams, like successful pr prioritization and understanding when to take the time to redo something or refine something is hard. What, what criteria do you use to help guide teams who are considering, well, maybe we should redo this or, Hey, we're 10 weeks away from launch. Maybe we should add something here. What, how do you, how do you use, do you have metrics for that? Well, we do get a lot of feedback. You know, one of the rules and people have probably heard me say it, our main rule for game development are great games are played, not made. So we play the game a lot, you know, the internal feedback, it's brutal you know, in terms of us looking at our own game and then sifting through that to say, what, what's most important? Like first you have to identify what's the most important problem. Hmm. And then we say here, what's the straightest line fix? Sometimes the straightest line fix is to delete something. Like right. we're not going to do this anymore. And that's the most painful one. But I think anyone who's made a game can look back and realize, well, that was the right decision. Probably, probably should have made that decision sooner. <laughs> right? You're laughing. You that You've been the there. Time. Yes. Yeah. And so I think one of the benefits we have, because a lot of, again, a lot of people here have done it together for a while, that they, they know that. And so they're not, um, you know, it's very, it's hard to think of a thing where you cut at the end of the project. You think, oh, I wish we hadn't cut that. It's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, you think about the ones you cut that if you had cut them sooner or stopped, you could have taken that time and put them into other things. Um, and so I think it's just looking at the feedback to know what to focus on. And there's a number of ways that I usually look at, again, what's the straightest line fix? It's not always cut something, but there can be, we have this phrase, take it out of the spotlight. Hmm. Um, I'll give you an example on Starfield. So the way the environmental damage works in the game on planets and on your suit, and you, you know, you can, uh, you have uh, resistances to certain types of atmosphere effects, whether that's radiation or thermal, et cetera. And that was a pretty, it's a pretty complex system. Actually, it was very punitive. And so we kept trying where you get these afflictions, we kept trying to tune it. We get a point where we're tuning it and you're having to heal those things. And what we did at the end of the day, and, so, and it was a complicated system for players to understand, is we just, we just nerfed the hell out of it. Hmm. Where it ends up being, it matters, but only a little bit. It at matters more in flavor. Like the affliction you get is more annoying knowing you have it than the game result. Usually, I'm generalizing. So it was, let's just dial it down. 
Because if we dial it way back, it becomes more flavor on the screen than it does a gameplay system we had originally wanted where, okay, I have multiple spacesuits. I have one for high radiation planets. I have one for really cold planets. I have ones for these environments. And I'm saying it now, people are playing the game, like you don't think about it that much. It might be something we address going forward, but that was one type of solution there. And I could probably go through similar or dissimilar things up or down where there's another system, hey, this one's really, really important to us. Um, you know, particularly gunplay, the minute to minute experience in your hand, if there was feedback there, it's like, okay, we really need to dial this in better and better and better and better. And we're really happy where that ended up, you know, the game in your hand in terms of what's the response time when I pull the trigger to the screen reacting, like every frame matters there. Um, for how the game feels is something you're going to be doing all the time. So, yeah. Excellent examples. And as a player, I experienced both, right? I, I definitely experienced that, that first moment where my suit starts failing and I got that flavor, but then I realized, okay, it's really not as important as this guy who's shooting at me and I'm running out of ammo and I really got to focus on combat strategy here. So yeah, I think that that's an excellent sort of uh, piece of advice for creative directors, designers who are wondering, well, how do I balance these things? So thank yeah, you. sometimes it's take it out, find the straightest line. Yep. We, we have this phrase, you know, put it in the spotlight. There are things you can put in the spotlight. You can make it more important just with game symptoms, or you can make it less important. So sometimes a way to fix things is like, we should make that less important in the game. Yeah. Um, we do that with, you know, horses in Skyrim. They're just not that important, um, but fun. Yeah. But they're fun. You want them, but yeah. like people would say, no, they should, we should put saddlebags and they carry all your stuff. Ooh, now they're way more important <laughs> if we, than they were the way we had, you know? Right. Yeah. So uh, a couple more questions about just production and how, and getting a game like this out the door. First, how do you test such a <sighs> massive game? Ooh, um, you take a long time. <laughs> a lot okay. of people. You know, our QA staff is awesome here. Um, and the whole team tests. That's the other thing. Oh, okay. We had a version of the game. One of our goals last holiday was everybody went home for a holiday break and the game was basically done. There hmm. were bugs and et cetera, but here's a full game. You can play it on your, we flighted it on, on the retail Xbox. You can play it at home on your Xbox and your PC. And this should be the game you're playing over holiday. And so we, the whole team, we test the game really all, all year. Um, just playing it all the time, tweaking it, fixing, I don't want to say how many bugs <laughs> that our games create. And so we had a lot of QA help. Um, and it does help understanding what kind of bugs your game can create. And then seeing patterns, using systems to go through the data. We do use some automated systems that that run through every space in the game um, just to look for and then get a report. Here's where it was slow. Here's where it crashed. Here's where something else went wrong so that we can focus on more of the systemic gameplay. Hmm. Um, you know, here's 10 ways to break this quest. And we're really happy with where we landed on this release. Give it, given the scale of the game, yeah. I think the team just did an amazing job. It's not perfect by any means. Like there are things that we're obviously fixing and going to continue to fix, but given the scale of it, where we ended up both on a, you know, bug that would block you from playing and performance was obviously a big one for us. Um, particularly on the consoles, uh, we ended up in a pretty good place. I think. Yeah. It runs really well. I, I, I think, and, that, and that's been echoed by reviews and, uh, some pretty hardcore critics out there. So yeah. congratulations on that. And and you said something that I'm not sure people picked up on, but I think it's a really important point. You said that the game was essentially finished last holiday. That's huge. And the fact that, and I'm finished is one of those loose terms, but I know the fact that you could take it home and play through it as a developer is, is at least in my experience, pretty unusual. Is that your standard approach? No, to no, we had. Okay. That will be now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We had, I think it was sort of a pandemic thing too, where people were at home. So how do we get builds at home? But even if you're working at home, you're usually on your PC. 
Um, we knew given the scale of the game, that's what we, that's where we wanted to be. So we made it a goal for this project. Um, and to have that much time to sort of be playing it and polishing it. Yeah. Um, the go home part, I think is very interesting. The things you notice when you're, let's say, even if you're working from home, you're on a PC, you're on a dev kit. But when you say, I'm going to put on your retail Xbox or, or in your case, PlayStation, whatever, you're in your like usual environment. You're on your sofa, your speaker set up as a certain way. You just came off of playing, uh, you know, Ratchet and Clank or Spider Man, whatever. And so you're instantly comparing to the last thing you were playing. And the way you see even your own game changes. Like there's yeah. some delta there in how you look at it that we found, everybody in the team found like really uh, impactful, both positive and then figuring out, hey, I think our 5-1 sound setup is a little off. Hmm. You know, can it could be anything. Yeah. yeah. Or font sizes or hmm. now you're sitting 10 feet away, whereas you're used to sitting two feet away. You know, maybe that's an indirect benefit of the pandemic in that a lot of us have been working from home and this is now our new reality sure. versus being in the office and having a setup that may not be consumer friendly, right? Uh, well, yeah. that's, thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's again, really good advice for anybody who's making a large game, get it done nine months <laughs> before you ship the game. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to jump to done, just done, but you know what I mean? Yeah. As, as close as possible. Right. And that's don't add features. Uh, that's, that's the big one. We did add some things. My, minor. Yeah. Don't say that. Don't, I'm joking. Uh, we could, we could go down that one. You'll too. have to react to the, be in, a, be in the position where your game feels done, done enough, where you're not dealing with things that you're like this, this layer of crust on a yeah. game that's not done. that You can't look through to see like, what's the game underneath it? Get it to the game that's underneath that crusty layer so that you can be looking at it with honest eyes. And then you're going to want to react to that feedback, whether it's sure. bugs or, we changed some of how the map worked. We changed some inventory things. Um, it's like, hey, what do you have time? What do you have time to tackle? What's most important? Well, I got to ask then one follow-up question to that. Did you originally plan to have the game call it substantially done at that time? Or is that just sort of the way it worked out? We knew we wanted, I won't say the length of time, like that nine month wasn't in the original plan, but I'd have to go back and look, honestly. I want to say it was four to, it was like six, like, hey, six months out, hmm. we want to be playing a game that feels done. Okay. Um, because maybe, you know, you feel like sometimes you launch a game and then you're catching up on things. But no matter what you do, it doesn't equal putting it out and 10 million people play it, right? Like True. anything you do internally doesn't equal that, but you can put yourself in a much, much better position. Great, great point. So let's, I want to talk about you just for a few minutes and, and talk about just your, about you. no, but you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been at this, at this job, doing what you do, making this magic for over 30 years, and you've been leading some of the biggest franchises in the industry. So what advice do you have for others when it comes to staying in this game and, and staying fulfilled? Uh, I mean, look, that's up to each individual. I can talk about for me, you know, I'm really, first of all, I'm incredibly lucky. It's the people I work with are just awesome. So it's, it's not just me that's been doing it for a long time. It's, it's a large group of people here. And then the new people that have joined, like when people come in, you see their excitement, like they grew up with Skyrim or whatever game it's, it's, you know, how can you not be inspired by that? Um, I'm lucky that I get to make the kind of games that, I love to play and people let me do it. So, you know, one of the reasons I like that we're successful is I get to do another one, <laughs> you know, that people, people trust me and trust the team here. Um, and we challenge ourselves. So we're not doing a lot of, this is just a sequel to this. The games are new. So it's quite, um, it's quite thrilling, challenging, but very thrilling to make them. I don't know what else I'd do. Well, you know, pure, go ahead. I mean, one thing that I think we see in any industry is that when you have success, you can often get pulled out of what you're doing into another area, maybe even further away from the craft. 
So how have you been able to stay so focused on driving this craft? That's a good question. And I'll admit that that part of it being pulled away has happened at times. Mm. I took, I don't know if I've talked about this. I think so. I, after Fallout 4, as Fallout 4 was wrapping up, I was feeling, I'd been going pretty hard for uh, 20, call it 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I was feeling like, ugh. And I was, the company was getting bigger and I saw some of the things happening and I, I needed to step away. So I took, I took a sabbatical. I took about three months off hmm. um, to sort of reset how I wanted to run things. And it was hugely beneficial for a few reasons. One was I had to prepare everybody for the three months I was gone. So I had to sort of, I was for, I forced myself to delegate you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. So then um, I have so many great people again that I work with that nowadays, and when I came back, it was, no, the studio is running operationally very well. So my involvement, you know, Ashley Chang, my right-hand man forever is the managing director here. We have studio directors in each of our four locations. Um, we have production directors on projects. And so... I try to, you know, people understand that my focus remains mostly creative. Obviously, I'm involved in understanding what's going on in production and what we should prioritize. But the in and out day to day of that stuff, they are way better than I ever was. They're incredible. So that I can focus on the big picture of the game, helping work with what's important, what's not important, um, and speaking to the whole, the whole studio all the locations and there's, we have about 450 people all in and making sure that everybody understands where we're headed, what our purpose is. Um, I love getting in the weeds on the game, you know, skill systems and things like that in particular, but yeah, a lot of good help is the short version uh, of that answer. <laughs> okay. I, and it's, to me, it sounds like you are again, sort of straddling this uh, creative leadership position as well as just an overall leadership position on, I mean, you're helming again, a giant, giant project, giant team. Do you have any specific philosophies on leadership in general? And is it different than creative leadership? I think it is. Well, they both, there's a lot of similarities. I don't know that I could draw the line per se, but I think the main thing that you have to do as a leader is give, give everybody purpose. Like, what is our purpose here together um, to give them perspective? One of the unique things in my position is I get to see all of the perspectives. I get to see what's going on at Xbox. I get to see what's going on in the press. I deal with, deal with the different parts of the company and the studio. And like, so I have a very unique, I get to see all of that. It's the one thing I wish I could give everybody sort of when you talk about a game you know, again, I like these sort of ring metaphors, like the giant ring on the outside is everybody playing it. It's very hard to conceptualize like how many people that is. Then there's this ring of like the press or the other influencer, people who talk about your game, but they're still outside. And it's a big number. Then you go in, you have like Microsoft, you have Xbox, then you have like Bethesda, then you have the studio, then you have your family. And in the middle, you know, you have yourself. Um, and I think I try to give people that perspective of like, hey, look at all of these layers and the things that it touches. Um, and so here's what it means to everybody. So here's what we need to focus on. Here's why, here's why it's important. It's not just, you know, these time people spend in these games and they, you know, hear it over and over. And we feel it, those of you who play a lot of games or make games, that time spent in them is really important time in people's lives. So they deserve our best. Um, and Here's, here's how we're going to go about it. That is such a great leadership speech right there. I mean, it's <laughs> something that I think giving, no, you're right. Giving people purpose is what we all need to remember to do as leaders. And I think that it's often easy to forget that. Uh, so thank you yeah. for, for sharing that. So given how much you have, you know, how long you've been in the industry and how much you've grown as a leader and how the company has grown, if you went back to many years ago, what would you tell a 25 year old version of yourself? Hmm. 
<laughs> maybe I'd say, be ready for it to be take twice as long and cost. <laughs> be ready <laughs> for it. It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll be much harder than you think, but it, it will be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love it. Good maxim and, yeah. and inspiring uh, at the same time. So Todd, any last words for fans who are longtime fans or even newcomers to Bethesda and Starfield? I mean, just I, I wish they knew how thankful everybody here in the studio is for all the time they've spent in the games, the support that, that they give us and, and how much we love doing it. Um, it's just, um, it's awesome that to be able to get to do this. It, it is the greatest job and a career that anyone can have getting to do this. And uh, we hope to do it forever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're awesome. And, um, you know, we, we take any, they care. They just care so much. Uh, and so we know how important it is to them. Thank you, Todd. Congratulations you. to you and awesome. the team. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. Good to see you again this way. Look forward to seeing you in person again soon, Ted. Absolutely.